Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian McDonald. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. I work at UCLA, and I'm part of a collective of educators called Geek Ed. Uh, I am sure, like you all, you're missing the actual Comic-Con experience. I'm clinging to my, my placard from, from years past. Um, we know that coming to San Diego every July is a chance for folks to find and engage in community, to have great conversations, to meet uh, new friends, and to learn new, uh, new things. And while we uh, are uh, all in this together in not being in San Diego, we believe that we can still all do those things. Uh, and I'm ex very excited to introduce uh, this panel today as part of our uh, Geek Ed series of panels. For those of you who are familiar with, with Geek Ed or who are new, uh, since 2011, San Diego Comic-Con has created space for uh, college student and K through 12 educators, whether that be in student affairs, uh, in faculty, researchers, folks who are doing uh, great uh, initiatives related to learning outside of colleges and universities, uh, college students, parents, to just come together and have conversations about uh, the learning process and uh, about the connection of nerd and geek culture to all things uh, academic, both K through 12 universities and beyond. And so we are excited to continue that work with this panel today. Uh, and we also want to state that, uh, you know, it is very important that the, these conversations have spanned a number of different topics from supporting college students through their experience and finding their dream job to looking critically at issues within our society as we strive towards, uh, towards equity. And we all know that there's multiple pop culture properties from comics to films that have done that. And so, uh, it is important that Geek Ed uh, tells our, our audience that uh, for us, the, the current moment is very important, as I know it is to our, our current panelists. And so we uh, will continue to do this work uh, and try to make the world a more socially just place through our little corner at Comic-Con. Uh, and we look forward to this conversation. So at this point, I will turn it over uh, to our panelists. Great. Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to our panel today, uh, Restoried, Reimagining Creative Privilege. I'm Ash Easton from Rush UK, based in London, um, and I am joined by Linda Selheim, Pip Brignall, Juliet Levy, Sarah Ellis, and Tess Tenenbaum. And we're going to be discussing, as I said, reimagining creative privilege um, and restoring um, encompasses both reimagining old stories and telling new ones. We're going to kind of look at uh, both both sides. Um, so we don't. So we just dive straight in uh, and, and not and waste time on, on introductions. We, I think you probably all have looked at maybe our backgrounds a little bit. I want to ask all of the panelists. We'll start with Tess um, and go around. Um, just if you could share an example of either a familiar story or history where seeing it told from a different point of view or by different people really changed its meaning for you or um, a story or history written expressly by or for a, a new voice that was particularly meaningful and impactful for you. So Tess, you can kick off. Yeah, I'm, I think the, the example of restoring that's been most powerful to me recently is a single player pervasive game by an emerging game designer called Jay Lee, uh, called Twain, T-W-A-I-N. And in this game, you receive a booklet, like a printed book, and it's a journal that you keep. And in that journal, you are given prompts to ask you to reimagine your own past. And the past that you're asked to reimagine is one in which you had a twin when you were growing up as a child. And sometime in your past, your twin went away. And your twin and you did magic together. And the book is the story of you reconnecting with this past self and this past twin that didn't actually exist. But over the course of playing this pervasive game in the world, in your daily life, you come to experience what it might have been like to have had a magical childhood with a magical partner who was your twin, who is now gone in the world. And it's a really powerful example of, of using restoring as a game mechanic because it gives you a chance to reinvent your own sense of self by telling a story about a past that isn't true that you can then choose to believe in in order to create new possibilities for yourself in the present. Uh, and it's beautiful and it, I broke out in tears at the end of the game and, and I highly recommend everybody check this out. 
That's amazing. Uh, Linda, do you want to give us your example? Yeah, I'll probably a little different approach that um, I'm, I do a lot of work in the secondary education space. And so I see a lot of work from high school students and educators. And recently, one of the educators that, that I've done a lot of work with, his students do a, a project where they have to tell a story about history and create sort of a, a museum in interactive 3D to tell this story in. And there's some really profound work around, uh, they had a women's history project that was really great to see the different ways that these students approached and um, turned out their projects. So it, I, th I think there's some powerful work being done in the, the usage of the tools and how they can approach stuff from a completely different, different way you know not not just games but yeah i love the fact that all of you come from such different backgrounds as well i think it adds like something so interesting to, to this discussion julia do you want to give uh, an example from, from your side sure so I, i'm a historian and historians are constantly telling different stories using old clues or discovering new clues and so this kind of restoring is just essentially part of our dna if there's such a thing as historian dna but i so when I had to start teaching students and essentially tried to get them to understand that, I realized that there's sort of an, an embedded authoritative voice in the way historians tell these stories, and I needed to break that. And so it's every time I teach, I realize how important it is to think about a story from a different perspective and essentially to invert that relationship. And, and it's sort of, it's literally every 10 weeks, I am amazed by if you just hand those tools over to someone else, how different the history looks and how different you read these clues. And it's amazing. That's great. Sarah, do you want to give us your example? Yeah, I mean, I think um, working with Shakespeare, it's really interesting to see those plays through different lenses through centuries, really, because they sort of relate to the time at the time that they're shared. And what's curious is when you if you look at a play, it's through the lens of the director often and their take about about that story or or the or the characters in that play and what that play has to say now and i think i think also the the elasticity of story and also maybe um flipping some of those cultural appropriations that were hundreds of years ago into a modern day context actually not only challenges the the story itself but challenges our perception around sort of traditional storytelling in a very sort of immediate way and I I think that that's why the um the lens around those plays and and the broadening of who is working with those texts and what new writers are coming through with is so crucial to us but I think most recently we um we did a, a production of Romeo and Juliet with our deputy artistic um, director Erica Wyman and and her premise of that entire play was we've let our young people down and so through that lens the entire play was conceived how it was cast how it was designed how it was how the how it was um, referenced and I think that's super interesting when we look at uh, pro cultural appropriation in storytelling. Uh, Pip do you want to give your example? Yeah yeah um... So I come from um, immersive tech, that's, uh, that's what I do at the moment, but I've come to it very much from theatre. And a lot of what I do in immersive tech is very much related to working with people within theatre and um, incorporating that sort of narrative form of storytelling. We're particularly interested with um, live performance, especially at the moment. And um, I think um, an amazing example for me uh, recently of sort of restoring was actually The Inheritance, which is, I know it's recently moved to Broadway, but um, I saw it when it was on at the West End. And the way that the play takes E.M. Forster's history um, as a gay man who was closeted and didn't feel comfortable or couldn't really talk about his homosexuality or write about it, um, and looking at basing, basing the play of The Inheritance on Howard's End, um, which is an incredible story by E.M. Um, by Forster, and kind of reflecting on how E.M. Forster's stories could have impacted society had, they been, had he been felt free to write about his homosexuality, 
what what impact that might have had on society but then also using the story of Howard's End as a sort of uh, framework for exploring what it does mean to be homosexual in modern day um, New York and even over the last 40 years you know one of the big things that they explore is um, the impact of the AIDS crisis and I think one of the main provocations really is had people felt more free to discuss homosexuality, to write about homosexuality, you know, prior to its um, legalization, then how many lives would have been saved during the AIDS crisis? And I think that it's, um, I, think, I just think that's a fascinating provocation and it really struck me when I saw it. I hadn't seen anything that, um, I don't know, talked so frankly about those kinds of issues on a mainstream West End stage before. So that was a big moment for me, I think. That's amazing. I, I love that we're getting perspectives from from theater, you know, TV, film, te all the different areas of tech that are kind of disrupting and creating new mediums um, from all of you. Now, I, I kind of want to, we can't ignore, uh, we're actually recording this uh, in June, which is, you know, uh, so everyone's gonna be watching this a little bit later, but we are in the middle of a pretty urgent uh, global conversation about racial inequality. Um, and I think that we can't really ignore that. So let's be very uh, candid, very open. If anyone has questions, by the way, drop them in the Q&A and we will, we will get to them. Um, but let's, uh, you know, not, not stray away from, from you know, what, what we're, we're going through at the current moment. Um, and I wanna talk about first um, everyone's thoughts on whether or not uh, other stories are considered universal. So typically we'll see white straight stories, um, especially from white straight male stories, um, described as universal. Uh, and you know, while other stories are about everyone else are kind of identity based stories. And I just wanted to see what your thoughts are and if this is still the perception um, and if so, how do we change it? And do we need to engage audiences differently when stories are different? What do you guys think? And feel free, jump right in. I'm not going to call on you. Mm. Pick it up, riff off each other. Can I actually, before, I, I want to tackle that question, but, but I feel like, especially in light of our current, current cultural moment, uh, I want to make certain that we're aware of where this notion of restoring comes from. Because it comes from critical race studies. And it comes from uh, a couple of Black authors in particular, Ebony Elizabeth Thomas and Amy uh, Stornaiulo. And it's grounded expressly in practices of education around restoring agency to marginalized groups and restoring voices to people whose stories aren't typically told. And I wanna make certain that when we're using this term and we're talking about it, that we're aware of its history um, and we're aware of its implications because the, the process of storying, right, is the process by which we as a culture produce narratives about what matters, what, we, what things mean to us, what we care about, the stories that sort of shape how we view the world. Restoring is a process that allows people who haven't been centered in those narratives to reclaim their own power and to tell new stories that give them agency that have been taken away from them when they were erased by a more so-called universal narrative. And that's how I'm gonna sort of back in to the question that you asked because the notion of universality assumes a norm. And when you assume a norm, you by definition privilege a certain perspective and marginalize other perspectives. And so for me, stories about others or other stories, they have the same power of universality that any story has, but they have additional value because they allow us to inhabit perspectives that are typically erased in our assumptions about what is considered normal in our current popular culture. Mm. I, can, I, I, have to, I would say that I, I'm, I'm so on board with what you're saying, Tess. It's, it's such a, um, I guess, I don't know, I don't want to bracket myself, but um, when I was thinking about sort of this discussion, um, from my own perspective, and I think it's important always to just sort of sort of speak from what you know. Um, I was thinking a lot about the representation of um, the gay experience in media and 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 books, film, TV, theatre, and um, the idea that you know a film like Call Me by Your Name can be such a 
um, mainstream film and be considered to be so universal because even though it deals with an experience that only, that is only the experience of a small percentage of the world's population, the actual um, experience itself and the humanity within it is universal. So I think it's that I think it's that that really important thing of. Um, acknowledging the, the 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 core humanity at every single marginalized people's experience. Oh, my! Like uh, Linda, goes, yeah. Jump on in, jump on in. No, I just I thought I was <laughs> muted. Oh, okay, <laughs> I thought you were trying to say something there. Yeah, go for it. Um, so I th just coming at it, um, sort of referring to the current moment as you know we are at a. There, this is a this is a moment, but it's been decades in the making, right? And sort of from the pedagogical perspective, we've got I mean it's what fifty years since Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Paulo Freire, Bell Hooks, sort of articulating very clearly that the canon, the pedagogical structures, what we are taught from a very early age, is all sort of shoved into a perspective that isn't helpful to what Pippa's calling our common humanity, right? That, and, and, and what Tess referred to as sort of this kind of this normalization of a particular uh, version of what is, where everything else that steps outside of it is, is is either wrong or different or marginal or not to be considered. And I think what's amazing about, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be alive right now to observe these sort of, you know, 50 years of, of what was sort of pushed on the edges of the margins of pedagogy and of critical thing, theory, sort of essentially coming, sort of being practiced, right? It's really wonderful when you shift from theory into practice, and I think this is where we are, and it's painful and amazing. Yeah. And needed and a good oh. kind of an important yeah. moment. Yeah, you know, actually, I, and I, that kind of feeds into you know talking about. I, I like what you said, Pip, about um, you know the difference between a story you know with other people and a story about being other. Uh, and and like let let's have a little a chat about that. Like, what's the difference with between a story about identity versus a story about something? like embodied by a person who is different. I, I just have one example, a personal one that I love. Um, it's a TV show on Netflix called uh, Schitt's Creek. I don't know if you've seen it. It's got Dan Levy. I'm obsessed with this show. It's one of my favorite shows. It's incredible. And the thing I love the most about what he did is, you know, it wasn't a show, there was nothing in the show about you know any negativity towards the character being pansexual uh they didn't even make an issue out of it it was just it was him and it was just him and his love story um and there was no, you know what i mean like it was all about the humanity of that character and i thought that was really beautiful and i, I think that i feel like a, there's almost a shift these days towards towards that what do you think i mean i'm feeling this with the new shira right now like the new shira is the most perfect restoring of something that had been disposable and commercial and cheap that's been now reborn through the lens of, of a queer woman, right? Like the, like the woman who created it, Noelle Stevenson, is a lesbian. And Shira presents a world without any of the history of anti-queer animus that we live with. And it's beautiful and, and it's refreshing and it's just, it's just there, it's just on the surface, it's in the text, it's taken as a given that this is just how people relate to each other, and it's, it feeds my soul. I think it's so wonderful. That's beautiful. Do you think there's still space for having both kinds of stories? Well, I mean, I think that people, I, I think that you don't have to be queer to love the new Shira, but I think that if you're queer and you watch the new Shira, there's something in there for you that you're not used to getting in other shows. So I'm going to go super lowbrow here um, okay. and, and talk about the Never Have I Ever show on, I think it's on Netflix. Oh, there you go. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, this is, right, this is, this show was not made for my age group. I mean, this is, this is, and it's sort of, and it's kind of the, 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 the fact that it's a completely diverse audience, right, which doesn't make it about diversity. Right? These are just teenagers going through their lives with, you know, and so at my grand old age, I can completely relate to their experiences because we've all gone through that. But the, 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 the cast of characters is radically different than any cast of characters in any show that I might have watched when I was 14. 
And, I, and, and that, again, brings us me back to why I'm so glad to be alive to watch this happening, because this is sort of, this is, this is just, a, you know, it is a momentous moment, but to a 14-year-old, it's just going to be normal. And it's, you know, they're Which not growing up with it. Which is incredible. And, and, yes. and, you know, Sarah and Linda, like from the theater and gaming side of things, do you see a similar shift as we're kind of seeing in TV and film? I, I see when I'm working in education, particularly in the secondary space, you know, the, um, you know, the diversity is almost accepted. It, it's not, there's such a, it's so different than our generation. And there's so many things colliding right now. You know, the, the ability to tell stories and all the tools to tell stories. And the, the there's a lot of um, digital inequity out there, you know, a lot of poverty around the tools that are available. Yeah. But it's, I just, you know, you're talking about the this moment in history, the, what they're going to do with this and how they're perceiving this and it'll, work into their, you know, it'll just be a part of their life. I mean, we all lived through 9-11. We lived through different things that seemed very impactful at the time, you know, but this is, things have been pretty good for a while. And all of a sudden, this is going to be their norm moving forward. And um, the tools they'll have to tell this story back will be pretty fascinating. I mean, I'll be, I'll be really honest. I think this systemic, problems with the infrastructure and how you make a lot of work in the traditional forms of storytelling that maybe in the emergent sector like gaming and, and what Linda's establishing is brilliant because that is that is creating a new language a new hierarchy a new system for storytelling that I think is super interesting and I think the convergence of like theatre and gaming coming together will make those voices much more interesting um, so I think from my perspective, I think I would sort of say we have still got a lot of work to do in, in theatre, um, both from a, from a perspective of diversity, but also class and, and, and how we create systems that are accessible for people to, to, to broaden the um, pool of storytellers in this space and the people that are making that work. And I think... Um, what I find really joyful is, is listening to the diversity of examples here around, around the work that's emergent and coming through. But also there are some sort of fundamental anchor points that, that root us in that change, which is around um, character and storytelling. And if a character is believed and, and the writing is compelling and the, the, the choices made in that story are... Are, are are thinking about how it is heard and, and that connection with that audience then then and we open up that audience's an imagination to those ideas then then you can create those those story worlds for audiences to imagine and walk in anyone else's shoes and i think that's that that's the interesting ground for me is how you converge that those those traditional frameworks and those emergent frameworks together and kind of create a blended opportunity for that as well um and that that I th as i say i think we've got a long way to go but i but i but i see it happening um i just want to make sure that the pathways are are genuinely open if you know what i mean in yeah. in the sense of, of the making of the work yeah actually I, that makes me think of what you're what you guys are saying about accessibility of um you know uh systems that enable the right people different people to get into into these worlds and um you know accessing the tools that enable them to build games for example or build vr and AR experiences there's still a lot of uh barriers to entry in in some of these sectors i just recently read this article um that it showed basically the class of a new theater uh, uh program uh, i can't remember where it was in the states to be honest with you but um, effectively, what they said was, you know, in order to get into this program, you know, you have to pay the fees to, to, to enter and then do your portfolio. And then if you get selected, you have to fly across the country for the, you know, so that immediately cuts out just so many people um, from having a, and, 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 you know, the class photo was <laughs> not diverse, um, to put it like very lightly. Um, and uh, they were just saying, and that was like a, a theater program, for example. Um, so like, how do, how do we create systems that are, uh, you know, 
um, make make these things more diverse. And then another example being, um, you know, coming from the the VR and AR worlds where the tools are very expensive to have like a high end headset and a developer laptop, for example. How do you get your hands on them? Um, you know. Just one example, uh, I, I co-founded something with my friend Nina called the XR Diversity Initiative, and it was really just like a, to upskill underrepresented groups with XR skills. And it's just like deep dive, hands-on workshops just to get the tools in people's hands because they don't have access otherwise. And it's very small, like we just, you know, it, and, and, and based off of like getting people from the industry to volunteer to do it. But it's like the, the things to get people to get their foot in the door. Do you guys have other examples of, of how that can happen or thoughts on what we should do? <laughs> Oh. Yeah. Tess, do you want to go for? I mean, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> All right. So I think what we're what, where we are now is a moment where the language of diversity, which we've all become sort of trained and inured to, is, I mean, woefully inadequate. Doesn't come close to what it, the problems with. You cannot fight um, sort of systemic uh, racism with diversity. Like it, it essentially, it's not enough to train everybody in the, the the benefits of diversity without actually changing the structures in which it operates. And I know that I'm saying something that everybody on this panel knows. But what essentially doing a deep dive into the, the, those specific structures in each institution that replicate that systemic nature of the you know digital inequity, educational inequity, the the in the the assumptions we have about what we mean by, I mean, I'm having sort of endless conversations about, you know, what is a quality education and the number of colleagues of mine who say, well, a quality education involves residency. Like, okay, so that means that you are essentially saying that you we cannot deliver quality education to people who cannot access campus. That is a that is a systemic problem, right? And so it's and, and it requires going one step further than just valuing diversity and actually set, questioning, okay, in our systems, where do we not fulfill that promise? And and that takes that takes time. So and while I'm extremely happy to be alive to see this moment happen, I'm also extremely tired to see how I mean, sort of, it's exhausting to see just how much work mm -hmm. there still is left to do. Yeah, I get all. The, oh, go ahead, Tess. Go ahead. I was gonna jump off of that and say yeah. so one of the projects we've been working on for the last two years is a virtual reality theater performance platform and it's called Shadowcast. it's inspired by things like rocky horror and repo the genetic opera oh. and other sort of participatory theater experiences oh. and right now it's just virtual reality musical theater karaoke and that's fun oh my god and that it, sounds amazing I'm in my lab that okay. i just can't and sing <laughs> wonderful um but inside this thing we've been building is the seed for something much more significant and interesting that addresses these accessibility issues that the julia is talking about which is that we're building an accessible lightweight vr theater platform where you can originate rehearse produce and perform works remotely in large distributed groups and this helps to hopefully, and my goal with this, is to erase some of the geographic inequities and some of the class inequities that prevent people from being able to access the arts, access culture, access theater. We know that students who are highly engaged in the arts, especially in rural communities, are twice as likely to graduate college as low-income students who aren't. And yet 95% of American elementary schools don't have theater programs. There is a huge opportunity to use media and arts to give people opportunities to collaborate and connect outside of their locality. And these are the platforms that I think are going to help give people the tools to tell their own stories and, and to join into the conversation that right now is confined to people who have access to, to money or to time or to resources um, or to just being in a locale where these things are available to them. Yeah, and then Pip, you're also working on a, a platform as well to enable uh, different, I'll let you explain it. There, you have two projects actually. I know one's with Epic, an Epic mega grant, um, and yes. another one is, is for um, the future of, of theater. So. Give you a chance to yeah, so I mean, well, one of the rate. one of the projects that we're trying to that well we're currently prototyping is a platform for yeah the um, creation and distribution of virtual theatre in augmented reality. So um, essentially, the the idea there is it came actually out of a um, 
uh, COVID response grant from the UK government um, facing, you know, with the theatres facing closure. Um, we were thinking how can theatre creatives who have spent so much time learning their craft and learning their skill, how can that be um, repurposed into the digital um, space without them needing to reskill and retrain all over again? And how can performers be included in that? How can the entire sort of theatre industry, you know, make that shift quickly and easily um, and yeah so yeah we're working on that at the, at the moment working with some really great guys who've done a lot of work in theatre visualization in terms of working with designers working with theatre creators um, to um, create sort of augmented reality and digital um, sets and staging and how you can use remote motion capture with um, avatars um, of actors, all these kinds of things that are, is very much in R&D at the moment. But yeah, that's kind of the idea. And I, I think ultimately the goal of that really would be to create something where you can create a professional virtual um, theatrical production, but at a much um, sort of more accessible um, cost than it would be to put on your own theatrical production because you're not having to build sets and hire rehearsal space and hire theatre space. And um, yeah, I guess, I, I suppose sort of to go back to the point that was that was made earlier in terms of sort of um, the accessibility of all of these tools, I think that, um, well, there's two points really, you know, if we look at all of us, um, it's probably, you could say it's not the most, um, potentially the most diverse uh, panel. And it's important to recognize when you do have a privilege um, and that you do have access to those tools. Um, it's important, first of all, not to uh, waste any opportunity that you have been given, but to use that opportunity to extend it to others and to make sure that what you're doing is beneficial to all levels of society, that you're not just um, making the problem worse um, through what you do. It's a great opportunity. Like, it's a great opportunity to to um, lower the barrier to entry, you know, yeah. to the, the industry. But the other thing I, I really love and appreciate about that is it's also another opportunity to make the industry more resilient. Um, Sarah, I know you're having to do tons of work with the Royal Shakespeare Company and all of this. Um, and it's a it's a we're going through <laughs> many big shifts simultaneously. Um, and it's uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Do you and can you speak a bit about like um, your work with Royal Shakespeare Company, Sarah? What yeah, you know, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think I think it's important to say on the 18th of June because um, it's we're dealing in cat years right now where, you know, it's moving so quickly, you feel like it's a day by day accelerated disruption that you're in of major sort of what I would call industries that have been around for quite a long time. And actually, um, when we talk about the social change and we've talked a lot about people change and, and how people behaviors change, we've also, we're also dealing with fundamental change around um, infrastructure for storytelling, which is a physical building. Um, that we we can no longer access. So what does that mean, and how do we look after that? And, and like Pip's exploring, and and Tess is exploring, is where are the new spaces? Where are the new meeting points for culture? Um, and how do we hold them? And how do we create those spaces? And I think at the Royal Shakespeare Company, um, we've always had a global community. There is a massive global community around around Shakespeare. Um, but uh, how does that look? Um, in this, in in where we're going, um, does feel very different, and it feels to me, will be with this time. Not only will um, we as um, producers experiment, not only we as the people that are our custodians of those buildings, um, maybe have to reevaluate that. The artistic community will be experimenting now of itself with the tools it has where it is. And I would be super interested if we look at the place of privilege where a lot of this digital tech has been converging with people that now need to get their story out that haven't had access and sort of seeing how that comes together. So for example, an artist, um, an actor that w wants to perform and Zoom is the way that they can perform now, but how, how do they hack those technologies? How do they subvert them through their artistic process? So we don't just look at the tech and mm. we talk about the tech, but we talk about the why and we talk about the, 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 mecha the urgency around that story being told. And I think 
Um, so my role at the RSC is to 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 enable the art, my artistic community and and people that make the theatre to have the tools, the toolkit that they need to make mm. for those stories now. But I've but I've been playing a long game of the past 10 years and now in the last three months have seen more curiosity and ingenuity in that than, than yeah. I've seen in the past few years. So yeah. I think, I think the, um, we, will, we will talk about things virtually, but I'm really curious about presence and liveness and togetherness, which is what theatre is about. But maybe our infrastructures have been about buildings and assuming that buildings provide to togetherness and liveness. And I would argue the next big question for us is where, how do we reclaim space with togetherness and liveness and, yeah. and how can that be achieved? That's super interesting from a creative just, perspective. Just on the, um, just, you know, talking about democratization of, of access and, and um, of, to of tools. There are two tools I just want to signpost people to if they haven't heard of them. Um, one is called Masterpiece VR and one is called Tavori. And Masterpiece is like a sculpting 3D tool that you can you can actually design in 3D in VR. So instead of having to take like years and years to learn Maya or you know some other uh, 3D design software where you design 3D in, on 2D platform, you can do it uh, very intuitively um, in in that in that medium. And then you can animate it in Tavori uh, in a way that's quite uh, intuitive and, and easy to learn um, as opposed to again having to do years and years of study to become an animator. Um, so I think like these kind of tools that are evolving as well, it will see, it'll be really interesting to see where that goes um, and, and yeah. that when that can mean for people developing new stories. So I mean, this, this is Comic-Con, we have, you know, a million uh, comic stories from DC and Marvel and, uh, you know, we see lots of origin stories and all of, and all of, all of that, you know, who, what's, who, what are going to be the next versions of those stories? Like who are going to be, be the people creating them and, and, and what tools will be available to make it easier to do so? Um, yeah, well, I mean, it's, oh, sorry, yeah. I was just going to say, because your project, the, uh, the EPIC project that, um, that we're working on at the moment. So it's been funded by an Epic Mega Grant. And yeah. one of the main things that we're exploring is exactly that. It's how do we, um, first of all, it's giving stories back. So we're asking people to go out and explore in augmented reality, how um, they discover artifacts and what stories can be, um, what narratives can be told from the discovery of those artifacts. But also we're trying to get the tools out to artists to be able to create those narratives within that um, sort of world scale um, platform. Uh, so it's about the, sort of the, the premise that underscores the, the, the game is um, about exploring the mar stories of marginalized sort of peoples. So one of the key things that we want to explore is exactly that. How do you get, how do you get these artists to be, to um, sort of any artist anywhere in the world to be able to create for a platform like that that is then has world scale distribution. Sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> I was just going to say that, you know, we've got this moment right now <clears throat> where we've all been pressed with doing things virtually. And I've, I'm seeing really, really interesting projects come through. I work on the education mega grants along with numerous other things at Epic and I'm blown away with some of the projects that come into the pipeline from all the way from uh, high school teachers through, you know, people like you that we've worked with. So, you know, we've got this, this sort of moment where everybody has to explore virtually and I'm seeing people and it, the tools, I mean, our, our tools are free obviously, but you know, I'm seeing really people being very ingenious with creating virtual productions. And mm -hmm. I was, I'm a big theater fan. So I was, blown away that when this everything shut down that some of the first people that went online to do things for people in the theater world they just went out there whether it was just a, a performance on zoom or something and I was it was exciting to see so now all of this stuff is kind of emerging and um, I always say when I talk to people about our tools and in education that we don't know what you're going to do with this in five to 10 years. We hope you break it. It's not just about games. It's about all these other areas because, you know, dealing with immersive content and using it belongs to everybody in every medium. We're, of course, we know simulation and all of in architecture, but, you know, I wish more people would be exploring these tools in theater and what we're going to do with them because that's an exciting space. And I think it's important 
for us to reach down into the secondary space and let people know that these are opportunities are out there to tell your stories. I mean, they don't realize that there's all of these pathways that's one of our big missions. I, I don't want to push you on the spot with this question, my next question for you. <laughs> um, but, you know, being Epic, Epic, uh, major company, you guys own Fortnite. I mean, you have a huge present. You have this massive hundred million dollar fund. Um, you know, you have Tim, Tim Sweeney, your CEO, who is like a big uh, you know, supporter of the open metaverse and um, where all of that is going. Um, you know, in, in the grant program, is there anything built into it to promote diversity uh, or ensure that you know this money is actually getting into the hands of different creators absolutely and i encourage people to apply with ideas this is the it's a little different kind of a grant application than most we have um i i am eyes on the education ones but there's also games, there's also enterprise, there's tools, there's different. But the, ed the education ones are really the most interesting because we cover everything. People come through with all kinds of really great projects. And everything from small grants to high school teachers doing something really innovative to, to you know, much, much larger cross collaboration with major universities. I mean, we're looking for innovation. We're looking for things that people can give back to the community to share. The grant program is really about that. It's about doing work that we can share back out so that somebody else can say, that project is so cool, I want to try something new and different too. So that's, that's really, please reach out to me if you have questions because I love working with people. Um, putting ideas I, together. I love how broad you kept it as well. You know, it's 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 ed entertainment and create creative industries, but it's also big enterprise, and it's it's really can be it's it's a great thing for what you're doing. I think at a community level. Um, so I, I also want to ask you guys. You know, we're talking about the development of of new stories and new perspectives in, in storytelling. Um, and I want to talk about you know who who owns these new stories um, and talk about like cultural appropriation and you know whose stories uh are these to tell um we want more representative stories but you know what are the tensions between these impulses to tell different stories any thoughts on that i mean i think one of the things that's beautiful about narrative and story is that once an author or a creator has put it into the world, they lose control over it, right? Like it becomes ours. It becomes ours to do with what we will. Um, and that's always in conversation with what the author or creator has done, which can create interesting dynamics. I'm thinking about She-Ra actually again, because it's, I just finished it and I love it. Um, there is a character in She-Ra who is seen by fans to be a transgender woman uh, and Perfuma, the flower princess. And she's never shown to be transgender in the text. It never appears in the show. But the creator of that character for the show meant for her to be read that way. And this was unconfirmed up until maybe a couple weeks ago. And the headcanon, the, the story that the fan community told about this character, wasn't concerned with the intention underlying the creator. They, they adopted this character. We, we chose to believe that Perfuma was trans, and we elevated this character. We identified with her. When the creator then came out and said, yes, this is what I had in mind, that created this, this closing of the loop where suddenly... It, like those of us who had chosen to produce a headcanon around this character suddenly felt validated in it. And so while we always have the power to claim ownership of any story in the world, there's something really powerful about being able to reconnect it back to the initial intent of the person who created that story. Wow, you said that so beautifully. Like. Yeah. <laughs> I tear up. That's so. That's really beautiful. I'm. I'm curious. Um, just because I don't. I don't actually know that story. When was it? When was it created? Uh, the the Shira show. Uh, yeah. Like when was it written? It was uh, so Shira. They started production on it. I believe in 2015. Please do not quote me on that. Um, 
Okay, I wasn't sure if it was like an old show that was readapted or something like this. The, I mean, and, and what's interesting is that there are lots of little Easter eggs for queer and trans people in the show. There's a non-binary character for whom everybody just uses their pronouns correctly. There are the star siblings, right, who in the original She-Ra were the star sisters, except that in, in this version of She-Ra, one of them is a star brother and is voiced by a trans man. And that's never made overt, but it's there for you if you want to find it. This is there for you to, to see yourself in if you wish to, if you're a trans or a queer person. That's really beautiful. Does anyone else want to speak about ownership of stories going forward and who should be telling <laughs> these stories? So I, I just I just want to add that I think um, should is a dangerous word and we should ne we should here I am repeating it um, good good <laughs> <laughs> but we should not say that specific people persons should be telling a particular story right there are there are stories that are told wrongly there are stories that are lies um, that are there are stories that are hurtful and that are dangerous but I I I I would be I'd be wary of saying that only certain type of people can tell certain types of stories. And, and you know, I am in the, uh, I'm in the nonfiction world, right? So, and, 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 and God knows the history field is, is littered with, with lies and with the wrong people telling uh, the wrong story. But, um, but I, I think the, the issue is more on, on process and on structures, back to sort of structures of power, right? So understanding what structures of power allow it for certain voices to be heard and certain voices not to be heard, right? And so, and, and, and developing a structure in which in the fiction or in the nonfiction world, we can see these developments in which we, rep, we, we reflect the shift in those structures rather than replicate them. And, and, and I think that's, that's sort of from my sort of field and from the perspective of, of sort of a, an academic historian, that is really what I hope to see. I want to remind everyone um, who's, who's watching that if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A. Um, I want to also, add, I guess, you know, go back to, to actions, guys, because what, what else can we do, you know, to, to work on expanding the, the narrative landscape? Revolt. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't realize I was unmuted. <laughs> so this is such Love a great it. time to give back because it's virtual. I mean, you can, you can share your time in a classroom or with a community group, or you can tell us, you know, you can tell your story or bring people together because a lot of people are stuck. <laughs> you know, I mean, this, this I think is a really great time to, for people to participate that maybe haven't participating in giving something to the community in terms of what you're doing. Yeah. I think, um, I don't know, something that, that I've found really, really cool um, during the last few months, just again, thinking about theatre really, is seeing so many companies broadcast their shows, you know, via YouTube for free and, you know, people can donate if they want. But in terms of expanding the reach of theatre and kind of making that accessible. I think that's been really great. And that's just a, a really cool use of, um, of technology, I suppose, to, um, to yeah, increase access and, um, yeah. I would just argue, listen, and, you know, use those traditional platforms as ways to, to maybe look at a shift in, in, um, in how we make that content and use the time when people are curious about about how how we have to do things differently um use that as a, a call to action to to follow that through um but in order to do that i think you need a moment to listen to hear the voices and let those voices just rise up a little bit and not make sort of what i would call culturally biased assumptions about what that means and that needs some proper care and attention i think it to pivot straight into a a sort of like um, a solution based on on old cultural norms would would be a missed opportunity right now. I I also and I just to piggyback on that because that is is exactly it right. We're in a moment where there's sort of uh, an urgency and and a sort of a need to act right, which is itself a, a cultural norm of like we need to find a solution to this problem. And the fact is, maybe we just need to look at that problem 
really deeply and wait for, you know, like we may not be the ones to solve the problem. And I think having a, a, a greater humility about under, you know, what the problem is and maybe we don't understand the full scope of it and, yes. and, and a greater sort of acceptance. And as you said, just listen to more people, just wait for more voices to join in. Yeah. yeah. First step is acknowledging that there is a problem, right? <laughs> Tess, any final thoughts from you? It's, I mean, I'm actually, I struggle a bit with this because to a certain extent, there are, there are certain stories I can tell, right? There, there are certain stories that I'm uniquely equipped to tell, and there are certain stories that I am not equipped to tell. And I, I, I want to sort of stay quiet for those stories and make room for the people who are equipped to tell them, to tell them. At the same time, I think that there is a, a paradox that comes from power differentials in our society, which is that if you have been historically silenced, then it's not enough to simply get out of the way and let you speak. We have to do more. We have to do more than just quiet the room. We have to actively lift up the voices that haven't been heard. And not everybody wants to do that labor, nor should everybody who has something to say that hasn't been heard be expected to take on the responsibility of doing the labor of educating, of storytelling, of, of advocating for change. And so we, I don't, I don't have a solution to this, right? Like, I don't want to be the token trans person in the room speaking for all trans people. I'm, I'm just one trans person. Um, if we had a black person here, I would feel really uncomfortable asking for them to speak for all black people. Mm. At the same time, like, how do we create opportunities to shift that power differential, to shift that balance of power in whose stories are told, who's heard? And I don't have an answer to that. I think that we're, we're all trying to figure that out. I think that's a really beautiful point to, to end on. I have just one last thing. I think it's a positive thing that I've seen come um, out of the last few months that I think has been really beautiful. And, you know, in, in this whole uh, idea of, you know, giving, giving back to the community, which you, you brought up, Linda, uh, of seeing, you know, people lending their skills. Like, for example, I've seen people rally together around, you know, um, a creator who does, may not have the resources to get their prototype ready so that they can go on to get funding to build that story. Um, and then, you know, different talents coming in to, to get that prototype built for them, for example, um, which may not have ever been able to be possible otherwise. Um, and that like pooling of resources to amplify, um, you know, other stories is is really a beautiful thing to see. I've I've seen it happen. I'd love to see it happen more. I'm sure we all would. Um, but yeah, thank you all, guys. I think we've come up to a run over a little bit just over our time. But uh, you're an excellent panel. Thank you so much. This was a, a great thank conversation. You. Thank you. You did thank a great job. Yeah. Thank you, Asha. And thank you, Comic Con. Yeah, thank, thank you, Comic Con. Comic -Con. Yeah. Yay, thank you, Comic -Con. Apologies for not moving <laughs> the right screen. We miss you in person. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, we do. Thank you for giving us this platform. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Brian. Much appreciated. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Brian, I don't know if you're still around and want to have a, a final word. Um, otherwise, we will just call it a... Uh, a morning for those of us on the West Coast and an evening for those of us in the UK. <laughs> and uh, talk to you all later. Okay, thanks guys. Thank you all so thanks, much. Thanks, bye. Bye. bye.